Hi everyone, and welcome to an overview of the 2024 Roundcube Webmail cross-site scripting exploit. This video will also serve as an overview and breakdown for CVE 2024-37383, which was the exploited vulnerability that allowed for Roundcube Webmail servers across the globe to have their emails exfiltrated in 2024. So before getting deep into the breakdown, I wanted to give a little bit of an overview of this attack, when it happened, how it happened, who was impacted. So in the middle of 2024, there was about 80 military and government organizations, primarily based out of Ukraine, but also Poland and Georgia, that had private emails exfiltrated via an, via an unusual cross-site scripting attack that exploited an SVG rendering vulnerability within the open source Roundcube email server. For background, Roundcube is a free and open source webmail system that has its source code distributed through GitHub. It's been in production since its initial release in 2008, and its server side code is primarily written in PHP with a JavaScript front end. Roundcube's target audience are internet users that intend to host their own email servers rather than utilizing email as a service providers such as Gmail or ProtonMail. This attack or set of attacks, according to the State Cyber Protection Center of Ukraine, is thought to have originated from hacker group Winter Vivern, which primarily targets governments in Europe and Central Asia. Sentinel-1 researchers suggested that Winter Vivern may operate out of Belarus or Russia based on information that they found when investigating this attack. So let's break down this attack and then jump into the technical details. So in September of 2024, a cybersecurity firm, Positive Technologies, received an email, they had an email forwarded to them that was originally sent to a government organization. Now, timestamps indicate that the email was sent back in June of 2024. The email appeared to be a message not containing any text, just an attached document. However, the email client didn't show the attachment. The body of the email contained distinctive tags with the statement eval A to B, which to code and execute JavaScript code, according to Positive Technologies. So as we can see right here, we have uh, two span tags, and within that span, there is an SVG tag that utilizes the SVG animate subtag or the animate attribute. And within this, it has an attribute called values. And this is key right here because you'll see on the screen, values is followed by JavaScript colon eval. And this brings us back to something called a scheme and uh, in particular, the JavaScript pseudo scheme. So interestingly enough, I actually wrote a blog post on this many years ago called Sanitize JavaScript Scheme to Prevent Cross-Site Scripting. So the way that web browsers work is they evaluate text that they find in the DOM and they evaluate text and they look for certain things called schemes, which they know how to interpret based on the browser DOM spec, which is maintained by an organization called WhatWG. There's a number of browser schemes, many of whom that you probably already are familiar with, like Mail2, File, or FTP. And there's a few that exist for legacy purposes that are a little bit more risky to use and uh, often present security risks. Some examples of that might be Gopher or JavaScript. And in this case, the JavaScript pseudo scheme was utilized in order to create a JavaScript sync for cross-site scripting within the SVG. So remember, when we're talking about cross-site scripting, we need both a sync and a source. The sync is where the code execution occurs, and the source is where the payload comes from. So in this case, both the sync and the source were this JavaScript pseudo scheme, and the type of cross-site scripting is stored because the JavaScript payload was stored on a server until the email was received, in which case it would be executed on a client device. The browser sees JavaScript, it pops open a new instance of the JavaScript interpreter and immediately invokes whatever it sees within that JavaScript scheme. Now, in the case of the Roundcube webmail client, Roundcube implements pre-processing. That means that if you include an animate subtag within an SVG tag inside of a Roundcube email, pre-processing will occur and it will actually remove the animate tag and replace it with a comment that says animate blocked. So how was a hacker able to execute this against 80 government organizations with the animate tag being pre-processed and removed from the finally rendered code in any of the emails that were viewed? Well, luckily, because Roundcube is open source, we can actually take a look at the function that is responsible for pulling out and pre-processing 
all of these subtags within SVG in order to prevent exploitation. And what we can see is that anytime the anime attribute exists, it is excluded from the final page if it contains the href attribute as well. In this particular case, the parser does not take into account the fact that the href attribute could include spaces. It looks for an exact match of href even though the browser is capable of removing preceding white spaces, making it so that href space or href space 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 would be considered valid once the spaces are stripped. As a result of this, producing an SVG tag that contains the subtag of animate with an attribute name of href space and a values attribute that contains the JavaScript pseudo scheme containing a cross-site scripting payload allows bypass of the preprocessor that is intended to prevent cross-site scripting within RoundCube and permits the animate tag to proceed onto the final step, which would be rendering inside of the client device or inside of any RoundCube user that views an email containing an SVG tag formatted as such. Now the specific cross-site scripting payload used in this case and the reason for the doc file attachment was that the cross-site scripting payload JavaScript code actually attempted to open the .docx file. Now the .docx file contained form fields, RCM login user and RCM login password, which correspond with a login and password for the RoundCube client. These would be added to the HTML page and displayed to the user with the expectation that the fields would be autofilled or that the user would manually enter the details in order to re-authenticate. Now, whenever either of these two scenarios occurred, the cross-site scripting payload would obtain the data from within these two fields, and it would send it back and exfiltrate the data to a server that was hosted at libcdn.org. At this point in time, the cross-site scripting payload was capable of executing all of the currently in browser within the same tab and within local storage data of the RoundMill web client, as well as passing back the user's round mill web login if it was either autofilled or if the information was filled out by the user when rendered within the round mill web client. It happened to be unfortunately the case for a large number of government employees in these countries. So now that we know what type of exploitation took place and how it occurred, how could this have been prevented? Well, if you've read my book, Web Application Security, Exploitation and Countermeasures for Modern Web Applications, you know that in the cross-site scripting sections in offense and defense, I speak about risks that you incur making use of advanced file formats supported by web browsers. Examples of this would be SVG, PDF, XML, Blob. And the reason that these file formats and these data structures for storing file data in the browser are risky is because all of them have methods of invoking JavaScript script execution. And we all know that the majority of cross-site scripting comes from JavaScript script execution. So in this particular scenario, there's a number of things that RoundCube could do to ensure this never happens in the future. Number one, they could utilize a tool like Cure53's DOM Purify and they could run the DOM purify sanitize function on all of the data that goes into these attributes. That would allow them to most likely, but not in all cases, detect JavaScript code when it's put into one of these sinks. They could also make use of some of the browser's built-in sandboxing functionality. One way of doing this would be to ensure that every single SVG image that is rendered into a email is rendered within an iframe, an iframe with its own origin. And that way, same origin policy would kick in and it would limit the amount of damage that it could do if it contained a cross-site scripting payload such that the JavaScript would not be able to traverse the DOM and access data outside of the iframe. That means only the data within the iframe that contained the image would be compromised. Another option would be on the server to convert SVG images to a more benign image format that's not capable of script execution, such as a PNG or a JPEG, which can be done through automated command line tools like ImageMagick. And finally, implementing a content security policy or CSP policy on the RoundCube webmail server could block this by specifying allowed JavaScript domains and requiring these JavaScript domains to have nonces and blocking inline script execution, which is one of the primary methods for preventing common forms of cross-site scripting attack and may have also been valid here. 
I should, however, note that I have not tried the CSP option and I am not entirely sure it works against inline JavaScript within the anime attribute of an SVG, although it does work against similar attributes that are present in the DOM spec, which you can find on WhatWG. So in conclusion, there's a few things that we can learn from this. Number one, cross-site scripting attacks still exist and still have a lot of potency out there on the web, but the cross-site scripting attacks that are being seen in 2024 and beyond seem to make use of some advanced browser functionality, such as these advanced objects like SVG, or prior, I also mentioned blob, file, etc. And I think in the future, we're gonna to have to look to these file formats with more scrutiny, and we're gonna to have to evaluate them and determine if we actually need all of this script execution functionality, or if there's some way we can just block it or bypass it on a global site or application basis so that we don't have to worry about any of these newly implemented or seldom understood or utilized features that are capable of script execution leading to a disaster like has been seen in these 80 government organizations throughout Europe and Asia. And that's all for this video. If you like this video, you're welcome to subscribe. If you have any questions, leave them in the comment section below the video. And if you want to learn more about application security from the perspective of myself and uh, many experts that I've interviewed and worked with, consider picking up a copy of my book, Web Application Security, Exploitation and Countermeasures for Modern Web Applications. It is linked in the description below this video. Have a good day and stay safe.